I, I could see the potential here after going this, doing marketing and business at uni. So the potential that there's actually something there that we could turn into a to a scalable business. So I spent, we've been spending the last three or three and a half years really like refining it, getting good feedback, getting the products listed, and really setting up the the foundations for a, for a, a business that could scale and uh, be be known in Australia and also overseas eventually. And and the reality too, though, is that your mother had uh, had actually used it in her naturopathic clinic, didn't she? That's that's right. Yeah. So she, while while in Tassie, she was using it on all her clients, uh, getting a lot of great results. She's also a massage therapist, so using it regularly for for that use, and had a lot of people coming in with different chronic conditions and pain and that type of thing, and as well as always recommending the regular things like magnesium and. Uh, glucosamine and a lot of the common things that people find beneficial. Uh, we, she started using Kumzia and uh, as a topical treatment for a lot of these different conditions, and the results were pretty amazing over the years, seeing a lot of great results. And while we can't cure something that's a chronic condition, um, it seemed to have definitely shown good signs of uh, helping people with find some relief. So it was this sort of um, feedback over several years was enough to actually pursue it and take it further. Okay. And yeah. and the the reality, though, too, is that, uh, I mean, you've got a national audience for this. Is that right? I mean, how big is it? How big has it become? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been quite a quite a ride. So it started off um, the first couple of years. We were um, very much about, like, getting that TG, like the, the therapeutic and being able to make these claims around the products and having that validation in the market. And over the last two years, we've sold probably close to 20, 30, or 40,000 of our most popular product. And we've got a, a, a mailing list of over 20,000 people um, that constantly are engaging with us and um, finding a lot of great benefits from our products. And we're still like really small, but um, we've grown a lot over a short period of time. So do you provide your product to any stores or anything like that? Can we get it from a store? Yeah, so at the moment we're in several chempros in Queensland uh, and in New South Wales we've partnered with Mr Vitamins and in Tassie Nature's Works. Overall throughout the throughout the country we're probably in two three hundred stores and that's growing all the time. We've just hired our sales manager to scale up that and have some, we're in talks with some other major chains at the moment to try and uh, build that relationship as well. So um, more to come in the, in the future. So you hope to get it actually into stores. And uh, otherwise, uh, do you sell it online? Yeah, online's our, our core focus. Uh, it's, it's because we can have that direct communication with the, the customers. Uh, we can ship it out to them and uh, know that the, the information they're getting is correct and reliable and they're using it correctly. So, yeah, primarily online's our main, main channel at the moment. Well, well, the great benefit of online is you actually develop a closer relationship with your customers and you keep getting repeat customers as a result. Exactly, exactly. So we're, we're very close to a lot of our customers and in we, the way that we're, we love having that physical, normal, normally, apart from right now, we normally like having that uh, face-to-face conversations with our customers as well. So the way that we do that is doing uh, several different expos around the country and this gives uh, our customers a chance to come and meet us um, if, they're, if they're a new customer, actually see that we're legitimate, we are a family business, and we are really believe in what we're doing. So that's an, one way of uh, connecting with our customers on a, um, in, at, a, at a face-to-face level, as well as being online. Uh, and the other thing, too, is you don't you also market through Facebook and Instagram? Yes, that's right. Big, big focus is that, and that's been a, a big driver of our growth. Seeing a lot of uh, a lot of great results um, through that, um, with the, that being the right demographic for for our products, and people being highly engaged and giving it a try, and buying Australian um, in the Australian market, and having a reliable source of great products. And of course, you can also have some great conversations with clients as a result, can't you? Yes, absolutely, and that's a big part of our. Our focus. Uh, we've had we see a lot of other companies who advertise on Facebook and 
online and they don't even respond to comments and questions that uh, customers have. Uh, we go above and beyond wherever we can to answer their questions there and then in real time. Uh, we have um, actually my brother who's the who's the key focus on doing that part of the business at the moment and really answering their questions and being as helpful as we can. That's quite extraordinary. <laughs> now, uh, you, you, you're you also, um, you've had uh, the various awards, haven't you? Yes, Congrats. yes. Yeah, we um, we got a big grant as part of the Queensland government about six months ago, and we're halfway through that program. It's called the Ignite Ideas Fund. Uh, that was pretty rewarding. Uh, it was great to get such a, it was almost $100,000 grant money, and that's been fantastic in not only growing our business and building our team over the last six months so far, but also in... Uh, at, like adding credibility to show that the a grant that application that I completed and submitted was seen as a, a viable business that they wanted to invest in. So that was really exciting. And then we've also been a recipient of a small business award, a finalist of small business awards this year that um, was being announced later this month, but that's been postponed till August. And we've got a uh, we're, I was a young business a finalist in the young. Business Leader of the Year in Queensland as well. Well, that, that's quite extraordinary, and, uh, <laughs> and, and this is for a company that was only established four years ago. That's right. Yeah, so it's been a quite a journey, um, and we're still a really small team until until probably six or well, less than twelve months ago. The last six months, we've started to add a few people to the team, but before then, it was really uh, myself and my mum. Um, and my brother as well over the last 12 months, but we've started to add a few to the team as, as demand grows and uh, builds out. And final question, uh, do you see yourself expanding to into overseas markets? Definitely. At, when the time's right, uh, we, have, uh, we have those, we envision that completely. We, we, we've, we decided that we'd focus on the Australian market to start with, build a real strong hold here and um, have a really good uh, customer base here. And then when we're ready, we'll uh, start to look at the Asian and American markets. Well, Hayden, it'll be fascinating to watch. And uh, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Lovely to speak to you, Leon. And now let's talk to Indeed economist Callum Pickering. Callum, uh, this week we had the unemployment figures and they went up to 7.4%. And employment actually went down, but uh, there was a big rise in part-time employment. What's your reading of it? Yeah, it was an interesting report. There was a, a very large increase in employment, the, the biggest on record. Employment increased by 211,000 people, by far the highest we've ever seen. And yet the unemployment rate increased to 7.4% from 7.1% um, the month before. There are considerable concerns about the measurement of unemployment right now for a variety of reasons. And so I'm tending to, to put more emphasis on what's happening with employment and hours worked. And both of those measures were pretty positive in June. Now, we've, we've still got a long way to go before we get back to where we were pre-crisis, while employment did increase 211,000. Employment since the crisis began is still down about 660,000. So we still have a long way to go, but it's a step in the right direction that does suggest that the uh, recovery is underway. Uh, we still have about 400,000 people who consider to have left the labour force and they're no longer interested in finding employment. They still have to find their way in. Yeah, that's right. And that's one of the reasons why we are placing more emphasis on employment rather than unemployment. So what has happened through the crisis is that employment has declined by 661,000, but unemployment has increased by just 276,000, with the, the remainder, about 385,000 people, consider, considered to have left the labour force. And the reason they're considered to have left the labour force is because they're not actively searching for work. Um, and that could be for a variety of reasons. They might be caring for children or people with disabilities or the elderly. They could not be searching for work, maybe because there just isn't that many jobs out there. But most of these people, almost all of these people, I would say, would be quite desperate for a uh, new job if they were able to get one. And I think that this, this group of people, uh, the 385,000 people, will probably flood back into the labour force over the next few months. So a dynamic that we're likely to see is that even though employment is likely to increase over the next few months, the unemployment rate may increase as well because the size of the labour force will be getting bigger 
at the same time that employment is increasing as well. And that's precisely what we saw in June. Uh, now, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, said that if you included that group, uh, it would put the unemployment level up to about 13%, he was putting it at. Yeah, there's a range of different estimates that you can come up with right now, depending on who you include in the data. What we do know is that the official unemployment rate of 7.4% vastly underestimates what the actual unemployment rate is. Uh, if you treat everyone who lost their job since the crisis began as becoming unemployed, then the unemployment rate is currently 10%. Uh, if you include people who are technically considered employed but have lost all their hours and maybe receiving the JobKeeper subsidy, then you end up with a number similar to what um, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg pointed to. The, the good news, though, is that the unemployment rate is declining in reality, even though the official statistical measure is trending upwards. We are heading in the right direction, but we still have a, a long way to go. And we are dealing with an unemployment rate that is as high as we've seen since our last recession. And, uh, and of course, uh, there's all sorts of talk about uh, the Treasurer changing or Treasury changing uh, JobKeeper. Yeah, and that's going to be a, a really important discussion to have. Um, we don't know what form JobKeeper will, will take going forward. It's scheduled to end in September, um, but it will surely be extended in some form. It's just a question of, of how we go about that. Um, it's unlikely that the policy will remain as is. Um, there, there might be a, a re-evaluation of which businesses qualify for the policy. It could also potentially be narrowed to certain sectors um, because we do know that there are some sectors such as uh, hospitality, arts and recreation, even retail to some degree, that have been hit to a much harder extent than many other industries and maybe in a, a tougher position as we sort of emerge um, into our recovery. But I would consider it certain that the JobKeeper subsidy is um, extended in some form. Uh, if by any chance the, the federal government does weaken the subsidy significantly, I think we would run the risk of a uh, falling back into another recession, basically a continuation of the uh, COVID-19 recession, which would be really damaging for the Australian economy and, and largely undermine all the progress we've made in you know, protecting the economy throughout this crisis. Um, so there's a there's a lot for uh, the Treasurer to, to be thinking about right now. And, you know, the state of the economy both this year and next year depends on it. Of course, there's a lot of issues for businesses as well. I mean, some of them might be struggling anyway and be using JobKeeper, but those employees would, would be accruing benefits as they go and the, and the company would still have to pay that out. Yeah, there's been um, increased discussion about this uh, recently and I, th I think it's an important issue that we need to, to bear in mind. The JobKeeper subsidy has done a lot of great work in supporting businesses and households uh, throughout this. Um, but there's sort of the other side of the ledger. There are some businesses that uh, would be in a, in a particularly tough situation due to the benefits that, you know, they need to be providing their workers, even though the businesses themselves may not technically be viable right now. Um, one of the consequences of JobKeeper is that there are a number of businesses that, that may not be viable and may not be viable come September um, that are technically continuing to operate because they are receiving that support right now. And as that support dries up, they could be in a, a really tough situation and, and may not be able to continue operating. But it, it's really hard to sort of identify what those businesses are right now, given the distortions that there are across the labour market due to the sheer size of the JobKeeper subsidy. So uh, JobKeeper is actually distorting these measures of labour market conditions. And it's, it's also creating a lot of uncertainty, isn't it, for households and businesses? Yeah, that's right. I mean, in terms of the size of the distortion, uh, the JobKeeper subsidy will count for around 7% of the Australian economy over the, the June and September quarters. It's a, it's a huge policy. And so it can be really difficult to understand precisely what's going on in an economy when you do have the public sector accounting for such a large share of, of spending, uh, particularly the money that the businesses are paying out. But of course, there's huge uncertainty around what that policy is going to look like, um, how much support certain industries or, or sectors will be receiving. Um, and that can be a, a real concern for both households and businesses alike. Both groups prefer to have a, a certain degree of, of certainty when they're making their decisions, whether it be spending decisions from households about what to buy and how much to save, or whether it be how many people to employ or how much money to invest on the business side. Um, so the sooner that the, the Treasurer and the Federal Government can get together and, and provide that certainty for households 
and businesses, the better. I mean, the other big issue, of course, is that the economic recovery could be slowed down considerably. I mean, we've got a second wave going on in Victoria of the coronavirus, and uh, we've got increasing concerns in New South Wales, and it's spiking over there. And uh, all of that could actually be quite a huge impediment to any recovery because New South Wales and Victoria are the two engine rooms of the economy. That's right. Uh, Victoria is around a quarter of the Australian economy. And of course, with lockdowns already in place, we're going to see employment and economic activity across Victoria um, decline over the next six weeks. Uh, But my calculations, uh, with this additional lockdown, I think the Victorian recovery is tracking around three months behind the rest of the country. Um, But as concerning as Victoria is, if New South Wales follows suit, then the Australian economy is in in a really tough spot. Um, because if you have a weak Victoria and a weak New South Wales, then you have a weak economy. There's not much that the other states can do to really offset the weakness that would be occurring in those states. So certainly we, you know, fingers crossed that the New South Wales can avoid that second wave, that, that the number of cases that they have doesn't increase materially from, from where it currently is. Um, because a, a, a weak Victoria is already a bad enough situation for us as we do enter this recovery phase, and we can't afford to lose New South Wales as well. So uh, what, what that means is, though, that Victoria and, to a certain extent, New South Wales will be an impediment to any recovery, and it will slow it down, won't it? Uh, well, Victoria certainly will. Um, New South Wales is still 50-50, I guess. You know, fingers crossed that they do avoid a, a damaging second wave and, and can continue on their path of recovery that they have been on for the past couple of months. Um, But yeah, certainly Victoria will be that impediment. We will see uh, employment and economic activity across the state decline, um, and it will remain weak for at least the next six weeks. And it's far from certain that Victoria will be in a place to uh, lift restrictions when that six-week period is up. Um, There's obviously a lot of uncertainty around that. And now that the, the genie's out of the bottle, um, containing the spread is, is now much more difficult. It's in the community. There's a, there's a range of, of cases that they, they don't know where it's coming from and they don't know who people have been interacting with. And so it's going to be much tougher this time to, to bring the spread down because the first wave was mostly through overseas travellers. It was mostly through the, the Ruby Princess and the tracing of it was so much easier. Um, whereas this time we could be looking at a situation where uh, the lockdown persists for many months, as opposed to the six weeks that's been publicly put in place. Well, that would also mean that uh, with the government uh, looking to modify the JobKeeper subsidy, it will create a lot of uncertainty and the government will have to be very mindful of all this when it's uh, framing the new JobKeeper. Oh, absolutely. What they do with JobKeeper is incredibly important. It's going to be one of the most important policy decisions that this federal government makes. And it may be a case where they end up providing different levels of support for states such as Victoria who are experiencing a second lockdown uh, versus other states such as maybe WA or South Australia who, you know, don't have any cases and are are well placed to resume business as normal. Um, So the JobKeeper subsidy could certainly change a lot over the next few months in terms of size and scope and where it's being applied. Um, that will be incredibly important for the economy over the remainder of this year and, and certainly well into next as well. Well, uh, if, it, if it's 7.4%, where do you see it tracking uh, the next time around? Well, I, I think that the official unemployment rate and the actual unemployment rate will continue to converge. Um, so I would estimate that the actual unemployment rate right now is about 10% versus the official rate of about 7.4%. And I think those two will converge over the next three months or so. Um, so I expect that the uh, official unemployment rate will tick higher, maybe above 8%, um, even though employment will continue to grow throughout that period. Now, there are some wrinkles to that sort of estimate. I mean, Victoria is obviously an issue, and Victoria could push the unemployment rate much higher. I expect that the unemployment rate in Victoria will be much higher than for other states over the next few months. And there's obviously some uncertainty around the the impact of that. Um, So that could provide some sort of uh, downside risk for the unemployment rate that could push it up towards uh, officially around, say, 8.5% to to 9%. Um, But certainly I think it will uh, shift higher uh, over the next few months, despite the fact that employment should continue to increase. 
it will take a few years till we see it getting back to about the fives, won't it? History suggests that the case. Um, previous recessions have taken a good five years, if not longer, to recover from. Um, the COVID-19 situation may be a little bit different because of the unique characteristics of this recession, but certainly we shouldn't expect the economy to rebound to what it was pre-crisis in the near term. I think that's an unrealistic expectation, particularly given um, the, the COVID-19 will stick with us in some way, shape or form for some time to come, whether it be domestically through what's happening in Victoria and to a lesser extent in New South Wales, or it be the impact that it's having upon the, uh, the global recovery, um, because the, the global recovery is not going particularly well, and that would naturally um, impact on Australia as well. So it, it could very well take a good three to five years for us to see an unemployment rate down at that low fives again. Well, it'll be something to watch out for. And Callum, uh, thank you very much for your time. And thank you. So what's happening in the news? Well, small and medium businesses trying to rebuild will have to access to cheap part guaranteed loans of up to $1 million, while the JobKeeper scheme will be split into a series of tiered payments and its eligibility criteria tightened. The measures were among those announced in Thursday's economic statement that revealed record debt and deficit forecasts, driven by alarming drops in revenue and massive increases in spending. The Morrison government will extend the JobKeeper and JobSeeker emergency payments for another six months, but both will be reduced after a Treasury review found they could act as disincentives to work as the economy recovers. A summary of the Treasury review compiled and released by the government also said that while there was a strong case for extending the programs, businesses need to be weaned off support as conditions improved. The revamp and extension of the two schemes, which will run from October until the end of March next year, will see the $1,500 per fortnight JobKeeper wage subsidy replaced by two tiers of payment to more closely reflect the incomes of people before the crisis struck. JobKeeper will drop from $1,500 to $1,200 a fortnight from October this year for those who are working more than 20 hours a week. It will be $750 a fortnight for those working fewer than 20 hours and a further drop to $1,000 and $650 from January until the end of March. On JobSeeker, the COVID supplement will be cut to $250, down from $550 until the end of the year. Mr Morrison says the so-called mutual obligation rules will be turned back on in August and people will be required to look for jobs and will be penalised for not taking a job. Treasury found that of the 3.5 million workers currently receiving JobKeeper, about one in four, or 875,000 people, were earning on average $550 more a fortnight than they were before the COVID-19 crisis. And Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe has quashed any suggestions the RBA will start printing cash to cover federal government debts, saying helicopter money would ultimately unleash inflation taxes on the country. In his strongest public commentary about the current global debate about the financing of government debts to deal with the coronavirus recession, Dr Lowe said there was no free lunch when it came to the creation of money. There is a growing push from some economists for central banks to embrace the concept of modern monetary theory, under which governments with control of their own currency print all the cash necessary to cover their debts. Dr Lowe, who confirmed the RBA was unlikely to embrace negative interest rates that have been put in place by some central banks, used the annual Annika Foundation address in Sydney to make clear that despite the growing interest in alternative monetary policy approaches, it would not be adopted by Australia. Dr Lowe said if a bank created money to be spent by a government, that money would be a liability on the bank's balance sheet. If the economy responded to the extra money with higher inflation and the central bank was unable to lift interest rates to curb it, then an inflation tax would be paid by the community as people face higher prices for everyday goods and services. And authorities will crack down on the way businesses comply with COVID-19 restrictions. After it was revealed that 80% of Victoria's cases since mid-May have been driven by people getting the virus at work. The government has corralled WorkSafe, the Victoria Police and the state's public health team to ensure that workplaces are obeying stage three restrictions, including working from home where possible. The renewed focus on employers follows a COVID-19 outbreak at national law firm HWL Ebsworth's Collins Street office, where at least six employees have the virus. And Australian agriculture is way off the pace as it looks to boost farm gate production to $100 billion a year by 2030 and is falling behind major competitors in investment, productivity gains and research, according to a major study into the sector's prospects of reviving the economy in the recovery from COVID-19. 
The Agribusiness Australia commissioned analysis found the nation's farmers were at least 6.3% below the growth trend required to hit $100 billion by 2030, and in danger of falling down the ranks of the world's leading food and fibre producers. And luxury is so last year, as consumers do without. Consumers say COVID-19 has made them more cautious about spending on premium and luxury products, with many willing to spend less on packaged food, alcohol, apparel and cosmetics, according to a survey of spending habits by consulting firm BCG. People plan to spend less on holidays and travel, concerts and cinemas, luxury products, jewellery, footwear and accessories, makeup and clothing, and more on food and groceries, apps and video games and household cleaning and home repair products over the next six months, according to the latest COVID-19 Australian Consumer Sentiment Snapshot. The research confirmed retailers' fears that consumers would be more value conscious after the pandemic, with respondents saying they were likely to trade down and seek value for money when buying clothing, beauty products, packaged food and alcohol. This was in line with an EY survey this month which found cost-conscious consumers had driven a resurgence in demand for private label or home brands. However, the BCG survey found consumers were prepared to trade up for products such as personal care, fresh food and medicine, and to support local businesses in sustainable causes. The survey also confirmed the shift to online shopping, with 9% of respondents making their first online purchase during the pandemic and 33% shopping online more more than they did before COVID-19. More than 40% of millennial women intended to increase spending online. And the COVID-19 pandemic is going to have long-lasting consequences on consumer habits, with nearly half of Australians expecting the coming years to lead to a heavy financial burden. The changing consumer attitudes and behaviours mean brands will need to rethink the way they market and sell to match the coronavirus-hit world and the recovery. According to a report, Brand New Australia, by research agencies The Lab and Nature, 48% of Australians expect the next few years to be financially difficult, 44% won't be able to relax until there's a vaccine, 65% believe the COVID-19 pandemic is a reset needed to reevaluate how we live our lives, and 58% want a simpler life when the health crisis is over. It also found us 36% of Australians are excited about opportunities to come after the pandemic, 49% want things to go back to exactly where they were before the virus outbreak, and 53% are worried about the future. The research comes from a sample of 6,000 people. It found there are five segments of people, safety seekers, the largest group at 26%, who are worried about the future, largely due to health concerns, Strugglers, 18%, whose concerns are about their financial security. Opportunists, 20%, who are excited about the future. Simplifiers, 18%, who are looking to change their lives post-COVID-19. Returners, 16%, those who are ready to return to the way life was before. And Australian commercial television networks are facing a problem unique to the pandemic era, as a captivated audience is voraciously consuming their content. Advertising revenue is plummeting. Aussie networks are reporting a big dip in ad revenue for the second quarter of this year, as advertisers, spooked by low consumer confidence and a weak economy, slashed spending. 7, 9 and 10 logged a combined $465 million in advertising over the past three months, which was 33% less than the same time last year. And using ABS and federal government data, Deloitte Access Economics estimates around 240,000 businesses in the hospitality, professional services and transport industries in particular are at high risk of failure come September. That's nearly 10% of all Australian businesses. Under the current federal government arrangements, businesses will receive their last JobKeeper payment on the 27th of September, around the same time as many rental and loan repayment deferral agreements are also set to end. This will put enormous pressure on the viability of many businesses and the economy as a whole. Around 40% of businesses across hospitality, professional services and transport have indicated their cash reserve can cover less than three months of operations in the current environment. While it's expected the business environment will improve over the next three months as restrictions are eased, but don't forget Melbourne, it's not known whether any improvement will be enough to enable businesses to recover, let alone to survive, without JobKeeper support. Within sectors, it appears smaller businesses with their higher fixed costs, smaller cash reserves and barriers to lending will find it more difficult to survive. The ABS Business Indicators survey published on the 24th of June observed that nearly 30% of small businesses have cash on hand to support operations for less than three months. And the prevalence and severity of cyber attacks are increasing at an alarming rate every year. So much so that statistics estimates that cybercrime will cost the global economy a colossal $6 trillion per year by 2021, with Australia among the countries most targeted 
by significant cyber attacks, according to analysis by one software firm. Password manager and authentication solution vendor, Speakop Software, which analyzed the latest data from the Center for Strategic and International Studies and estimates by Cybersecurity Ventures, ranks Australia in sixth place of countries across the world which have experienced the most cyber attacks classified as significant. And for Coles and Woolworths, the pandemic era has been good for business. Australia's two supermarket, Bearmus, have gobbled up another six percentage points of the total Aussie food market in recent months. By nature, larger retailers are better equipped to weather financial turmoil than smaller operators, and that has played out globally during the crisis. The soaring supermarket sales will likely continue if the virus persists, as consumers continue to shun eating out. The restaurant and cafe sector's share of Aussie food sales has slid from 24% to about 19% so far. And construction of utility-scale renewables projects, new public transport infrastructure and the restoration of threatened ecosystems could see as many as 76,000 new jobs created during Australia's COVID-19 recovery. A new report from the Climate Council and consulting firm Alpha Beta says projects include organic waste management, energy efficient improvements in existing buildings and new urban green spaces to help secure the best value for government stimulus dollars helping re-engineer the national energy system and renew key industries. Alpha better economist Andrew Chalton, a key economic advisor to Labor Prime Minister Kevin Rudd during the global financial crisis, highlighted projects in regional areas and sectors with the greatest number of job losses. The report also prioritised jobs that would require minimal worker retraining to enable rapid re-employment of laid-off workers during the recession and faster action to address damaging climate change. A third of the job openings would be in occupations requiring either on-the-job training or less than 12 months of formal education. About 27% of the jobs are specialist roles, while 40% would require one to three years of training. Under the $22 billion plan, major policy opportunities across 12 areas would represent 76,000 potential new jobs created over three years. About 70% of the jobs would be in construction and administrative services, sectors already with combined cuts of 80,000 jobs due to COVID-19, while 40% of the jobs would be based in regional areas. The report shows Australia's national jobs shortfall is worsening, with the percentage of the workforce looking for more hours than they now have increasing from 3.3% in 1985 to 10.6% in 2020. And Kogan.com has reported a more than 100% increase in its gross profits through the first quarter compared with a year ago, with strong sales and customer increases driving the result. The company reported gross sales in the fourth quarter grew by more than 95% compared with the fourth quarter in 2019, while gross profit grew by more than 115% and adjusted EBITDA rose by more than 149%. And controversial security company Paladin made a profit of $1.3 million a week from its refugee contracts on Manus Islands, according to court documents. The revelations tabled as part of a dispute between former director Ian Stewart and Paladin will refocus attention on the contract which was the subject of questions in Federal Parliament, Senate Estimates hearings and a report by the Auditor-General. And Bauer Media Australia has announced it will close eight of its magazine titles, Harper's Bazaar Australia, Elle Australia, InStyle, Men's Health Australia, Women's Health Australia, Good Health, NW and OK Australia. The publications were put on pause and staff were stood down back in May due to travel restrictions and declining advertising revenue caused by COVID-19. An ardent ledger group is facing potential fines of up to $4.5 million after being charged over the deaths of four people at its Dreamworld theme park in 2016. The listed company confirmed in a statement to the ASX on Monday that the Queensland Work, Health and Safety Prosecutor has filed three charges against its subsidiary company, Ardent Ledger Limited, the operator of Dreamworld. All three charges are Category 2 charges for alleged breach of Section 32 of the Work, Health and Safety Act 2011. Each charge carries a maximum penalty of $1.5 million. The charges come after a coronial increase earlier this year found the deaths of the tourists to Australia's biggest theme park were avoidable. Coroner James McDougall said Ardent Ledger was responsible for systemic safety failures at its popular Gold Coast theme park. Coroner McDougall outlined a litany of safety failures on the Thunder River Rapids rise over 30 years. He said there'd been no proper safety assessment of the ride by a qualified engineer since it opened in 1987 and during ad hoc modifications. He said managers at Dreamworld had ignored previous incidents where there'd been problems on the ride and not done anything to fix underlying problems. In a 279-page report, 
the coroner also criticised inadequate training for staff and non-existing safety features, including an emergency stop button that could have prevented the tragedy. Coroner McDougall referred Ardent Ledger to the Queensland Office of Industrial Relations for a potential prosecution. And one in four community sports clubs, few that will not survive lockdown 2.0, with the Australian Sports Foundation calling for $1.2 billion in government and private funding to survive the pandemic. Lindy Murphy, president of the Melbourne University Lightning, which are part of the elite Victorian Netball League, said they were experiencing massive financial pressure. She has foregone any payment and coaches have taken a 25% pay cut. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to the Accommodation Association CEO, Dean Long. The Accommodation Association is a peak industry body and represents close to 3,500 hotels and nearly 58,000 employees across Australia. They've been doing it hard during COVID-19. And I'll be talking to RMIT Professor Sinclair Davidson about Treasurer Josh Frydenberg's latest budget outlook. In the meantime, you can find me on Twitter, talking BizBZ, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing you all a safe 